Jim. And the choir, y'all did good this morning. <laughs> if we will. <clears throat> Our next song is, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Now, I know a lot of y'all have sang this since... Well, I won't go there. <clears throat> Uh, but we've sang it all our lives in the Baptist church, most of us. So, folks, let's sing it out that we really, really mean it. If we have Jesus in our heart, let's sing it and sing it loud. <laughs> Uh, 
the TV tray, so to speak, and with the uh, chairs, what we're going to do instead is make my life a lot easier. My landscaping boss always used to say when I was at Southwestern, uh, uh, work smarter, not harder. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide up in two rooms. One room will actually be over here uh, uh, preparing cards for those that are at home or visitors or those that we want to follow up with or neighbors that you like to invite to church. Uh, we can do that. And then one room over here, we can do the prayer time. And so we could alternate the next week and switch people over so it's not the same people uh, doing the same thing. I just feel at this time we need to move forward, be efficient, productive, and effective. And that is one of the ways that we can still do that by praying, going over and reading God's Word, and still reaching the community for Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 So uh, I'm so glad. I see we have some people that in the church. Uh, I would hate to call you visitors because when you step into this door, you're family right away. And we would love for you to have to call the bulletin to tear off. There's a little side here of the bulletin that you can tear off. And uh, we're not asking if you're not a member here today to give anything financially. Uh, you do as the Lord would see you fit. We're not here for your, your money. Mainly we're here for a relationship with you. And if y'all could tear that off and put that in the offering plate, I'd love to get in touch with you and pray for you and uh, love on you. So uh, I'm not trying to track you down or stalk you. Uh, but just definitely want the love on you. So let's go to the Lord and pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, how great you are. We sing about it, and Lord, we can testify it in our hearts how great you are and how you have been in our lives. Oh God, such a great a testimony, a salvation that we have, Heavenly Father. Lord, we're praying for everyone in this room. We're praying for extended family. And Lord, we're praying for the Grigsby family, Lord, as uh, Robert deals with the passing of his brother. Oh, Heavenly Father, we lift them up to you to comfort. God, that you'd use Robert as an instrumental piece, Lord, in your plan through this time of grieving. And give him strength, his wife's strength. Heavenly Father, for many of those that are at home battling with cancer, we know about four that are dealing with that. We had a praise report, Lord, if Larry McClain's going to be able to have surgery. But God, we pray for the surgery today. And God, I pray that we continue to bless the care ministry. Even Mr. McClain said he was affected by that. He got a card from someone. And he was so excited. He's encouraged. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would encourage those in attendance, those that are online. Heavenly Father, that you would be leading this service by your Holy Spirit, not I, not the music minister, but Heavenly Father, your Spirit would move within us to lead, to lead this congregation. O oh Lord, you'll never leave us or forsake us. Be with us as we glorify your name, O oh, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. change up here. <laughs> We're uh, going to do a little instrumental. See, the Spirit moves and changes up things of orders of worship. One of my dad's favorites. Y'all keep my mom and dad in prayer. Amen. So they're still uh, battling uh, the COVID um, virus. Uh, so y'all keep, <laughs> keep the whole family in prayer. Yeah. 
does he have two wives to begin with? Well, all I can tell you is I'm only able to handle one. But him, he has two wives. And no pun on Shannon, but boy, could you imagine keeping up with Solomon's household? How many wives did he have and concubines? I mean, he was just wore out, wasn't he? But look, we look at here at Elkanah. He has two wives, uh, Hanina, and he has Hannah. And these wives are at odds with one another. It's not, in fact, that Hannah wants to be at odds with her, uh, but the other lady that's having children becomes a rival, the Bible says. She becomes evil and what? Being downcast to Hannah. Let's read in verses uh, 2 through 7 because we see Benina actually becomes discouraged, uh, uh, tries to discourage Hannah. He had two wives. Uh, the name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other, Benina. And Benina had children and Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from the city here lead to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophenah and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah, the sacrifice, he would give portions to Benina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. You know, it's one thing to be mean to somebody, but it's another thing to be mean to somebody in church. It's coming to this point where Hannah is even being discouraged in the house of the Lord. She is being discouraged not at home, but when they go up and try to worship God, you will have sometimes people that will come and pit themselves against you. Uh, they don't want to see you worshiping a holy God. How could you worship? You don't have any children, and God has surely closed your womb. I mean, if you wanted some friends, you would go look at the book of Job, and I'm pretty sure Job had some pretty good friends he would call up if he needed any help. Discussing anything biblical, did he not? No, my friends, in this case, Hannah was a rival to the other woman. The other woman would discourage her. Uh, Elkanah, I mean, again, how could you have two wives? Well, in the case of Jacob, you want one uh, that is ugly and you want one that is pretty to make up for it, maybe. I don't know if it's in this situation. He didn't have a bag over the other woman's head. We know that he gave a double portion to Hannah, he loved her. He really loved her in his life. But you see, Hannah was becoming so discouraged, so discouraged, so irritated at the situation of not being able to have children. So much so uh, that we see in verse 8, the Elkanah was discouraged by Hannah. You see, it's not only the woman that becomes discouraged when you're not able to have children. It is also the husband. It is also the man in her life that can become discouraged. Let me tell you, this is some very practical steps right here that we see from Elkanah that he is in fact discouraged because what? It feels like what would only benefit Hannah, what would, what would ever satisfy her, is not her husband. But in fact, having children. Having children will fill the void in my life. And what it looks like to a husband, as we see in verse 8, is that he is not living up to the standard. That he is in fact not satisfying her all the way. We look, it says in verse 8, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you eat and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? You know, when you see some movies and you look at some of the Christian movies and you see a couple going into the doctor's office and the doctor either looks at the woman or he either looks at the man. He said, it's your problem. You are the problem in essence. Or he looks at the woman and says, no, in fact, it's your problem. You are the problem. And in fact, when the couple is sitting there 
they are filled with so much emotions. And up tonight here in this sense is filled with hard emotions because he doesn't feel like he can be the husband that he needs to be. Hannah, am I not better than ten sons? You know, we see in God's Word that the first institution that God created was the marriage, even before the church. He created the family. And yes, God is first in our life, or should be. Second of all should be our spouse. And third should be our children. And then fourth, you can reckon in there, job, ministry, whatever it may be. But we see here that Elkanah is actually feeling insufficient as being a husband. Because why? <coughs> he cannot be a father. You see, in the Old Testament times, it would be looked upon someone that could not have children as not being a blessing from the Lord. It could also look like God has just put His hand on someone else to bless them instead of blessing the other one because they are barren and this person is being blessed. Look at all the children they have. Oh, they're a blessing. So do we walk over to someone that's not able to have children and say, they're damned of God. My friends, you better not be unbiblical in that attempt. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it says right here, God closed her womb. God prevented her from having children. You know, Jesus was on the road and when people came up to Him and said, Why did you let Lazarus die? You know, it hurt His heart as being 100% human to realize, yes, Lazarus is dead, but something else is about to happen that you don't see that God sees. Lazarus is going to raise from the dead. Do you understand there's something that Hannah and Elkanah and other people in this situation in this story do not see? Even the priest of God does not see. God's about to do something supernatural in her life. I'm going to commend to you today that having a child is a miracle from the God. Have you ever seen the developmental process? Have you ever seen the 3D, the 4D pictures that you see of the baby developing? Listen, my friends, children are not a mistake from the Lord. That means even if you did not have them while you were married, you had them before you were married, God still has a plan for that child to live and to flourish in His name. Listen, it's a hard thing to digest. We know that Elk and I, He is... A married man. He is married to Hannah. And yes, she is discouraged. But what Hannah does not do any longer should apply to our lives. She doesn't continue to see a can on the street and continue to kick it one by one. The can gets a little further. She goes up to the can and kicks it again. Eventually, you've got to pick up the can and throw it away, right? Well, in Hannah's situation, if I, she was tired of kicking the can down the street in her discouragement. She was tired of dealing with the same things time and time again. You know what she does? Her other friend, the wife of her husband, is not helping her. It seems that she is somehow in her discouragement. She's affected her husband. You know what she does finally? Oh, she's in great distress, the Bible says. In verse 9 through 11, look at this. Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. You see, friends, you can continue to go to other people to get opinions. Opinions are like a rear end. Everyone has one. And let me just say this. We can go to a person, we can go to another Christian and get advice, but I've even known Christians to give unbiblical advice by using a scripture out of context. You see, Hannah's going to realize the priest don't have all the answers either. You're going to realize real quick with me, I don't have all the answers either. But I am in the same boat as every one of you in this congregation, those that are online, to recognize there is one person that has a solution to the problems. You see here, she goes to the Lord of hosts. 
Her distress is more than she can bear. Her anxiety, her fear, all her troubles is too much on her. She can't fix the situation. And nobody on planet earth can fix the situation. But she knows God will listen. God will be attentive to her prayer. And we see also that Eli tried to discourage Hannah. Oh man, it's bad enough when you want to go to the pastor for advice. You want to go to the priest for advice. You leave out there more discouraged than you went in. And you see, she comes to the place of worship. Now it says in verses 13 through 14, As for Hannah, she was speaking her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, How long you make yourself drunk? You see, in life, practically speaking, not trying to illuminate your past of anyone that's dealt with this, but there are crying drunks in the world. They drink and drink and then they cry and act like that's helped their problems and they go to sleep drunk, intoxicated, wake up supposedly sober, maybe with a headache, and, and, and they continue to drink again to try to escape reality. To escape reality, Eli and a lot of the religious leaders in the book of Acts had a problem interpreting God's movement. You see, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit fell down. There were people coming from all over, coming to celebrate Pentecost. People from different languages, people from known dialects, they were coming on, and then the people and the Holy Spirit just fell down, and they said the fire rested above their head, and so they, they started speaking in tongues. By the way, the Greek word is a known language. These were languages that everyone understood. This was not gibberish or ecstatic motions to God. This was a language to spread the gospel. And so they were speaking in languages, and, and, and people were looking around, and, man, they're drunk. Peter said, I know what, by no means. It's early in the morning. They are not drunk. The only thing they're influenced by is not alcohol. They're influenced by the Holy Spirit of God living in them. You see, Eli, as the priest, should have recognized that she was in fact seeking the Lord. Yes, she was praying and her lips were moving, but words were not coming out. And back then, it would be good to hear an audible prayer. That was probably most practiced in the Old Testament, the way of doing things. Uh, the way I pray is I like to pray with my eyes closed. Why do we close our eyes? Because there's distractions. You start looking at a clock. You start looking at a TV screen. You start thinking about things you want to go do. But when you close your eyes, you're concentrating on what? Praying to the Lord. What is a good habit for you maybe in prayer? Is to speak out loud. In fact, speaking out loud helps you uh, concentrate on not uh, getting sidetracked. There's been many times in my life, yes, my mouth was not moving, uh, but my, my, uh, uh, I was praying, I was trying to seek the Lord, and I was distracted. I was distracted, and my mind went over here, and before long, 10 minutes, then went down a rabbit, and then now I'm back to prayer again. So speaking out loud has been good for me in prayer because I can concentrate on the Lord. Hannah's way of doing prayer, which there's no one way wrong or one way right kind of ideal. It's a way, but not the way. And we see here with uh, Hannah, she's praying and her lips are moving. She has to be drunk. She has to be intoxicated. As we're going to see tonight, Eli had a lot of problems in discovering God's spiritual family model for his own life. But we see here, he accuses Hannah. And now let me say this. It brings or tries to bring discouragement on her life. And of course, Hannah replied, no, I'm not, I haven't been drinking, I'm seeking the Lord. And of course, uh, Eli turns his tune a little bit, did he not? And he said in verse 17, that Eli answered and said, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away and ate. And her face was no longer sad. There have been many times of prayer that you have walked in sad. Have you not? You've been greatly distressed. 
You've been stressed out. Anxiety and fear, and even some people have had clinical depression because they have let these things insulate them and isolate them from God's people, from God's Word, and from prayer. But Hannah, having all this weight upon her to be a good wife to her husband, to be a, a godly woman in the midst of persecution, so to speak, she is greatly distressed. But oh, she goes to the Lord. She doesn't let that prohibit or take away her worship from God. She goes to Him and gives it over to Him. First Peter 5, 7 says in God's Word, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. She's going to someone that can have the solution, that cares for her, that will listen to her complaining, her dropping, whatever it may be. She goes to God and she speaks out and says, God, help me with this situation. You know what she did? She might not have got the answer that day. And a lot of times we go to prayer and we just ask God, please God, just answer me right now. I want it fixed right now. And what seems to be a delay is God's timing. God is working something out that you can't see. Now God may not answer a prayer request because we pray what's according to God's will. You really want something that's outside of God's will? Well, that comes with consequences. But Hannah is going to God and praying to Him, and she leaves away what? Secure. Knowing God has listened. Knowing God has heard her prayer. Knowing her emotions have been vented out to God. She's given it to Him, and she's laid it at the cross, so to speak. She's put it into God's hand, and she's open to the opportunity to see what He's going to do. What is it that you're praying for today? Who is it that you're praying for today? Have you been discouraged in your prayer life? It's easy to do. I, for one, as a prime example, it's easy to be discouraged at times in your prayer life. We live in a McDonald's culture, do we not? I mean, you can go get Walmart pickup. You can go to DoorDash. I was at the South Carolina Baptist Convention, the Impact Conference on Thursday, and they were giving out uh, red box codes. Uh, red box is like Blockbuster. I mean, it's a thing of the past. I mean, you can go to apps now on your TV, you pay for that uh, thing right there, and you ain't got to worry about any late fees, do you? You don't have to worry about all that. We live in a fast-paced drive-through culture right now that is attention starved, so to speak, for the Word of God. Uh, it's easy for us not to slow down. We just have fast-paced thinking, fast-paced ideas. In American culture, we want it right then, right now, all the way. And if we do not get what we think we're entitled to or deserve, sometimes, even in prayer, we can go to God and blame Him. God, why didn't you allow this to happen? And a lot of times God is like, when have you come to me? When have you been spending time in my word seeking my face? When's the last time you really truly prayed and wanted to hear from me anyway? And now all of a sudden you find yourself in a crisis. You know why? Because you were not seeking the Lord. You were not calling out to Him. But Hannah calls out to Him. She seeks the Lord. Eli turned his accusations into affirmation. And he actually says, go and let the Lord do His work. Uh, but Hannah and Elkanah, they stepped out on faith. I would say, in fact, in verses uh, 19 and 20, they probably fell into the bed. Because it says, they stepped out in faith. It says, then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. You're talking about keeping the Sabbath holy. They worshiped the Lord, went home, and took care of business. And you know what they were doing in essence? They were stepping out of faith and trusting the Lord to provide if He was going to work, if they were going to have a baby. What is the use of having relations anymore? They could have came to the thoughts. It's just not enjoying the spouse, but I want to have a baby. This has to lead to something. Rewarding. 
besides pleasure. I want satisfaction in having children. In verse 20 it says, It came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. You see, Hannah has the baby growing in her womb. Now there is going to be a conflict of interest for some of you. You say, well, Matt, I'm not still able to have a child. Why did God answer that way for me? I have no way to answer that fully for you. I have to say that it is discouraging at times. Could he, by the way, have been opening you up for adoption? Could he, by the way, for you not having children, could have opened you up to be one of the best grandparents you could in your children's life for their children? Could God be working something out that maybe if you had children, you wouldn't have followed Him? Or maybe if you wouldn't have had children, you, you, you would, have, would have sought some other direction and way. We can continue to speculate here today. But one thing is for sure. We do not speculate on God answering Hannah's prayer. He allowed her to have children. And only on the premise, listen to this, that she was going to dedicate her son to the Lord. If you give me this, God, I will do this. Many times we go to prayer, don't we? God, if you let me out of this bind, I promise to love you. And we continue on that path. And continuing on, trying to make a promise to God and somehow bargaining with God. She was not bargaining as one at a flea market. You say, that's $2. We take it off. You say, that's $10. $3. I mean, you've seen it. People go to yard sales and you mark that thing down really low and they still try to bum any nickel and dime off of you like they've been coming from Asia somewhere. Oh, no, no, no. Too high. $5. Oh, we take a nickel for that. A nickel? Nickel out of town. You know, I mean, this situation right here, Hannah has come to the realization that stepping out on faith and giving it to the Lord, whether he provides the child or not, her heart was in the right place. Her motives were justified by the Lord giving her the child. She said she was going to give him over to the Lord. This boy, his name was going to be Samuel. And did he serve the Lord? Oh, yes, he served the Lord. Faithfully, he faithfully served the Lord and loved the Lord. And Hannah has this child. By the way, she gives her child to the priestly order. She only sees this child once a year. On probably the most. She goes and worships the Lord. She might send items to the child. But this boy is fully commissioned and given over to the Lord. Now we know Hannah, she stepped out on faith in chapter 2, verses 2. And she praised the Lord. She had a praise, a psalm in her heart, a testimony to the Lord. She says in verse 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. She comes to the realization that there is nobody that's going to fix my solution. There's nobody I can pray to. There's nobody I can really give over my emotions, my distress, and my anxiety like the Lord. There is no one that we need to go to on the Lord. But sometimes this is what we do. And I have been solely guilty of this many and many a times the Lord has convicted. We go to the Lord, we have a fast prayer, and then what we do? We get out of there, we start running for everybody's opinion. We start asking everybody's opinion and advice. And there's nothing wrong with asking a godly person advice about a godly situation. But make sure these opinions are from the Lord. I've heard it many a times in the pulpit. I've heard it from God's people too, not necessarily here. Uh, that this is the Lord's will for your life. I heard a word from the Lord. Let me just tell you this. The only word you need to listen to mainly is God's word. A lot of people will have opinions. A lot of people will give you advice. But only God's word is going to remain true in your life. Only God's word is going to do the changing. Only God's word is going to do the transforming.
forming in your life. And so Hannah here is realizing nobody has a solution like our God. Nobody has an ear to my prayers like my God. There is no other rock like my God. He will not be moved. And I will not be moved in my faith. Because God is my foundation. He is my stronghold. He is the deliverer. He forgave me. He listens to me. His Holy Spirit comforts me. He challenges me. And He guides me to green pastures. Oh, do you know the Lord this morning? Do you really know God? Not only Hannah has given up this child, has she not? She's given this child over to the Lord. But we also look that God blessed Hannah with more children. Look at uh, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 2. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children from this woman. In place of the one she decided to the Lord. And they went to their own home. The Lord visited Hannah. And she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. This morning I ask you, as Hannah has continued to have children, what about your children that God has given to you? When is the last time you prayed for them? When is the last time you wept bitterly that God would in fact be with your children, guide your children, get them to come to church, wherever it may be, get them to read their Bible. When's the last time you called your children and had a devotion over the phone with them? Never give up on your children because God never gives up on you. He has never given up on you. No matter how much your children has disobeyed and went off on their own path, as a father... As a mother, you have the responsibility spiritually to continue to pray for them. You might not have the authority to get them to do what's right. They choose their own way. They're adults. As I always said, if you're 17 and you're old enough to go to jail, you're old enough to make your own decisions. Well, you know what? These decisions require them worshiping the Lord. You say, well, Matt, I've tried to uh, share with them Scripture after Scripture. Man, I have been praying. Let me just tell you again. Luke 18, 1. Do not give up in prayer. Consistently pray for your children. Consistently pray for your spouse. Consistently pray for your friends and relatives. But you know, there might be someone here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And it's no coincidence, it's no accident that you are here in this congregation today. God's wanting to do business with you. And until you get to the point, like Hannah, that you are desperate for the Lord, that nothing else is working, you tried to fix your own problems, you tried to do it your own way, and you continue down the road of rebellion. Now God has saved many people in different places. I've heard people being saved in a restaurant and bathroom. I've heard people being saved in church. I've heard people being saved in a near-death life experience. They've been saved into the hospital. My stepdad received Christ two or three days before he exited this earth. And died. For my situation, uh, I received Christ in a county jail in Anderson, South Carolina, 17 years ago. The Lord saved me, changed me, and gave me a new life. For anyone in here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture said today is the day of salvation. For anyone that does not know the Lord, He loves you. He's loved you more than you could ever know. And by the way, when I say that, uh, we don't consider you visitors when you come to church. We consider you family. There's nobody on the face of this earth that is going to love you more than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a pursuer. He's after you. He calls you to come do business with Him.
Because He loves you. Yes, we are a sinner. But you can be a sinner saved by the grace of God today. Now we can come up and play immediately. Everyone stand up uh, with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Heavenly Father, there's someone here that needs to do business with you. Lord, I don't know if they know you. Maybe they do know you and they've drifted away. Either way, Lord, you love them. For anyone in here that would like to receive Christ, I'll be wearing my mask and I'll be down front at the altar. You come down and do business with the Lord. For those that want to come and kneel down at the altar and pray for their children, pray for their grandchildren, the altars open up right now. Heavenly Father, I'm praying. Whosoever will, will come down the aisle right now and accept Jesus Christ. Lord, for those that need you, for those that want to join the church, whatever the case may be, God, I pray, Heavenly Father, you would draw them. Heavenly Father, for those that don't have the words to say, don't know how to express it, Lord, they come down to the altar. And God, your Holy Spirit, God, us with words we cannot express with groanings, Lord, your Holy Spirit will listen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we need you in our lives. so much for coming in attendance today. Thank y'all. You're all welcome here. And of course, like I say, the often plates will be on the way out. I had to take down my mask. I had to put on my windshield wipers on the glasses for sure. Defogger on, right? Need a little button right there. Uh, but so glad y'all are here. Tonight we'll be talking about uh, the sins of Eli's sons. Uh, so definitely join us tonight. We look forward to also seeing you here for care ministry on Wednesday night. If you need anything, reach out to the deacons, reach out to me. We'll help as best as we can, uh, uh, driven by the Holy Spirit, of course. In Jesus' name, y'all are dismissed. Amen. Uh, business meeting. Oh, business meeting. Y'all just uh, greet me. Whatever.